Once again, good morning. Good morning. If you have your Bibles with you, please now turn with me to Psalm 2. <clears throat> and please stand as we read God's Word together. Psalm chapter 2. The Word of the Lord. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens slaps. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath. And terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Father, you are our King. We ask that you'll speak to us today. Allow us to behold the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that our lives will be transformed forever. In Christ we pray. Amen. Let me now take your seats. Have you heard of the Chronicles of Narnia? It was written by Clive Staples Lewis, a.k.a. C.S. Lewis, who was a, who was a British writer, a literary scholar at Oxford and Cambridge University, and a Christian lay theologian. He's best friends with J.R.R. Tolkien. And some of the books that Lewis wrote, sp 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 uh, sorry, specifically the Chronicles of Narnia, it tells about the adventure of the imaginary kingdom of Narnia by a talking lion named Aslan as they fight the witch and restore the throne to its rightful line. In the second book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, siblings Richard, Edmund, Susan, and Lucy entered through a wardrobe and led them to Narnia. And from there, in one of the scenes, the beavers, Mr. Beaver, he was explaining to the siblings about the coming of Aslan the great lion. And in chapter 7, Beaver said, he's the king. He's the lord of the whole wood, but not often here, you understand. Never in my time or my father's time, but the word has reached us that he has come back. He is in Narnia at this moment. And in chapter 8, Lucy asks, is, is he a man? Mr. Beaver sternly said, certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the woods and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Do you not know who is the king of the beast? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. My family loves this story. It's a clear depiction of what our heart truly longs for, a king. A true king that will save us, that will provide refuge from our turmoils, problems, and even the hostility of this world. All of us in this room, we have this memory trace for a king. We long for a king. You and I are made for a true king. Psalm chapter 2 clearly says that 
to us. We all need the king. A king that is not man-made. A king that is not just an imaginary king, but a king that is already proclaimed himself king in eternity past, in the generations that already been done, and even for the future to come. You and I are made for a king. The book of Psalms are songs, a call to praise the Lord. The Psalms, 150 Psalms, are God-centered, rejoicing and anticipating the salvation that the Lord has provided. And it is a collection, like what I said, 150 poems divided into five sections. And the Psalter would express variety of emotions with his sovereign Lord and King. Book 1, you can find in Psalm 1, Psalm 1 until 41. Book 2 is in Psalm 42 to 72. Book 3 is in Psalm 73 to 89. Book 4 is in Psalm 90, 106. And Book 5, Psalm 107 to Psalm 115. The psalm that we just read ago, a while ago is called a royal psalm. It is written by David, though in some of our translations, it says it, it's anonymous, but there's a reference where Peter talked about this and he showed in the book of Acts that it is not David. Okay, sorry, it is not David who's the king, but he's the writer. Psalm 2, historically, is about the people of God that they would remind themselves of the king David, and the descendants after him. The very reason why they would sing this is that they would remind themselves that from the very beginning, from their forefather Abraham, God has promised that he will use Israel to bless the nations. And through the line of David, this will be a reality. But we know that David is dead. So as a foreshadowing, the book of Psalms, particularly in chapter 2, it speaks about the triumph of King Jesus. From eternity past, from generations past, until he comes. Friends, you are made for a king. And deep inside in our hearts, you long for a true king. And the main idea I'd like to advance in our time together is simply this. Our true king reigns. Our true king reigns. In three sections that we are going to divide Psalm 2, in verses 1 to 3, we're going to see, first, we hate the king. In verses 4 to 9, we have a true king. And in verses 10 to 12, we need the king. So, let's dive together. Look at verse 1. David starts with a staggering question. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Staggering because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and those who dwell therein. Psalm 24, 1. Which tells us that every human being on earth is under the authority and sovereign rule of God. Now how come these nations are ready to put a war and they are plotting in vain? Because this is the time where David is going to be coronated as the king. And the other nations are now starting to be terrified because this king, David, declares that he was anointed by God through Samuel. A one God that declares that he is the rule of all nations. And we see that David sees that they are not at ease. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? It only reveals that mankind, because of sin, do not want authority. Amen? Yeah. In one way or another, 
our desire is to seek modern liberty. Our desire within our hearts is actually to have democracy and to place ourselves a triumph of individualism. And if there's someone who's going to control you, if there's someone who's going to tell you what to do, you start to rattle. Verse 1 shows us a deep-seated rebellion, not only to David as the king during the time, but against God's authority and sovereign rule. And David's question in verse 1 is a clear representation of what global rebellion looks like. The nations rage, and they are plotting something against the king. Look at verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves. So they gather together, those who are in opposition of King David. They gather themselves, and the rulers take counsel together. So they're providing like a special meeting, not via Zoom, but they're huddling each other and say, we need to do something. We need to put that king to death. And that's their main goal. Because verse 2 says, their attempt is against the Lord and against his anointed. They were not content that God is ruling, winning, and saturating the nations through the leadership of David. So they have proposed, they have plotted a revolt against the reign of God in the nation of Israel and the world. Friends, we hate the king. We hate the king. The word anointed there is similar to what 1 Samuel chapter 10 notes, where Samuel anointed both Saul and David setting them apart as king, whose task during the time is to rule in Israel and to embody a covenant of faithfulness that God has promised to his people, to Abraham. But there is someone greater than David. Yes, he was anointed by Samuel. Yes, he was set apart uh, as a king, so that he will be different from the rest of the kings and the nations, because he is representing a holy and righteous God, but there is someone greater than him. Because the word anointed means Messiah. But we hate the king. Any kind of rule that is placed on our lives, we retaliate. You want to know, you want to get some proof? Look at verse 3. And here's the plan of the kings and the rulers. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. A wonderful imagery because David is using like, if you're under someone's authority, there's a yoke placed on you. Which means that if you are under someone's yoke, you are then obliged to submit and to follow. And what the kings are doing, let us burst their bonds. We don't want to do anything about this kind of yoke. Let's cast away their courts. The kings and the rulers are saying, I want freedom. And friends, that's what we also say when we hate the king, isn't it? I want freedom. I don't want any kind of authority placed on me. I don't want to be under a yoke where there where I need to follow what the king says, it's actually a shame to be under someone's yoke. They wanted democracy, but they didn't know how to lead their own lives. We hate the king. Ever since the fall, mankind has been in pursuit of glory, a very kind of glory that exalts self. And the heart's desire is to be dominant and be, be uh, preeminent in a cycle that you will always what? Win. We hate the king. In one way or another, all of us in this room 
hate any kind of authority that calls you to follow. You want an up-close treatment on this? I have a suggestion. Raise a toddler. Raise a toddler. Okay? Parents in this room, you've seen how your kids growing up defy authority. Yes? Are they all good? Are they all saints? Right? Okay? Even my son, others would say, oh, he's a very behaved kid. Oh, he's behaved, but wait. I'll invite you to come to our place and you'll see how rascal my son could be. Raise a toddler. If you're not convinced that mankind hates authority. And friends, the motivation of the Gentile kings is the same as to how the world revolted in the first coming of Jesus Christ, who is our, who is our Messiah. Take a look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 13. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Matthew chapter 1, verse 16. Then Herod became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all in that region who were two years old or under. And consider also the arrests of Jesus, the trials, the condemnation in the very hands of Annas, Caiaphas, Pilate, and Herod. And this is a continuing scene for mankind. Isn't it that in John chapter 1, turn your Bibles there, John chapter 1, John gives us a wonderful picture of how we hate the king. He actually uses the word light here, but see how we respond to the coming of the sun. John chapter 1 verse 9, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And look at verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet. The world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. You and I hate the king. You and I hate the king. It is our deep-seated rebellion and disobedience to choose ourselves and not God. And if we hate the king, it only means that you are an enemy of the king. You are not part of God's kingdom. And for some of us, you may not directly or explicitly tell that, but the way how you live your life is a clear example on how you hate God. Of course, no one in this room will say, I hate God but you consider about the things that you do every week. Where is God in the picture? You think about the priorities that are placed in your calendar. You think about the things that you're going to do for this year. Isn't it mostly of those things are about us and not about the king? The sad part is that even if we hate the king, we choose our lives to be the king. Like what I said, there is a memory trace in our hearts for a king. The problem is if you're not going to get that in Christ, you're going to get other kings. Not to serve you, but for you to be the king. Hey, think about this right now as you are seated. Can you honestly say that Christ is your king? Friends, we hate the king. 
king. And we are enemies of God. Before our conversion, before we met Christ, our minds are hostile before God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 tells you that clearly. That we are dead in our transgressions and sins. And we are what? Sons of disobedience. Romans chapter 8, verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. All the people in the world hates the king. And it is only through the grace and the mercy of God that can change our hearts towards the true king who truly reigns. But take a look at verses 4 to 9. We have a true king. We hate the king. But the word is clear as well that we have a true king. Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs, and the Lord holds them in derision. The psalmist then now mocks the plan of the earthly kings. David is saying, our true king sits in his throne. He is not shaken. He is not moved by any kind of plan that you guys are doing. While he is seated, what he's doing right now, he laughs. Similar to what, the, what, what God's people did when they constructed the Tower of Babel. After mankind finished constructing it, Moses said, God looked down. One pastor theologian says, God's laughter on his enemies teaches us that he does not stand in need of great armies to restrain the rebellion of the wicked men. He communicates, David is communicating to us that God and his anointed are not bothered by the futile attempts of man's revolt. The Lord holds them in derision, mockery. Look at verse 5. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and ter terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. It's like David is saying, Be careful to what you guys are doing. Think twice. Because he's coming for wrath. The right response of a king to his enemies is to defeat them. The right response of a king to his enemies is not to tolerate anything that they are doing that is against him. The right response of a king is for them to face his fury. That our God is able to provide true judgment and pure justice to those who deserve it. Behold the divine laugh and the divine wrath of God. We have a king. We have a king. And God says, and David says in verse 6, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Zion is one of the great places in Jerusalem, and that's the very place where the king, the anointed king, will come. And we see here that God has enthroned his chosen king, his own son, even before the foundation of the world, that God is fulfilling his promise to his people that this king's reign will never end. The declaration that speaks about the enthronement of Christ at the right hand of God. In the New Testament, you see this also taking place in Matthew chapter 21, verse 5. The triumphant entry of the Lord Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. 
where He was declared what? The Messiah. The very words of Matthew says, Behold, your King is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt and foal of a beast of a burden. We have a King. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, For by Him all things were created. It's Jesus in heaven and on earth. Visible, invisible, invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Then in verse 7, take a look. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. King David remembers what was uttered to him by prophet Nathan from the Lord during his coronation in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, and your throne shall be established forever. But we know that's not David ultimately. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. When David said, I will tell of the decree, that is the very decree of our God Almighty that He has planned and purposed in eternity that His Son will come. That His Son will come. Focus your attention on the words, You are my Son, today I have begotten you. Sounds familiar, isn't it? In the New Testament, we see this as a future time in which the promised Messiah will come. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. We call this incarnation, the human fleshing of God. And we see in the following verses, Romans chapter 8, verse 32, He who did not spare His own begotten Son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And let's not forget John 3.16, isn't it? For God so loved the world that he what? He sent his begotten son. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake he made him to be what? Sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 7. In Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which God set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. We have a king. We have the king. And see in verse 8, the scope of the son's rule and power. As of me, and I will make the nations your heritage. And the ends of the earth your possession. Which tells us that the rule of Christ as our king is unmatchless unrivaled, unending. Jesus Christ is king over all the earth and the nations. Church, we have a king. It's not David. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the king who will restore everything back to its original design. And this king continues to reconcile people back to him. And look at verse 9. You shall break them. See the power of this king. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. There's no one like him. 
be terrified. Which also tells us, look here, that we don't mess with our king. He is serious in providing his fury and wrath to his enemies. And he is not going to back down. Yes, he is good, gentle, loving, and caring. But please keep in mind, similar to what uh, Mr. Beaver in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe said to Lucy, he is not safe. But he is good. He's not safe. He's also wrathful. And in our culture today, for us to understand that God is wrathful is somehow for us, oh, that's not connected to God being love. No, it's connected. God being wrathful tells us that he is righteous to judge. God being wrathful means that he is holy, just, and able to keep his word and to also provide refuge to his saints and his people. And this is the posture that David is trying to give to us, that yeah, we hate the king, but please understand, we have the king that reigns today. And in the very righteousness of this king, he cannot tolerate any kind of sin, any kind of pride, similar to what the kings and the rulers are trying to plot together. When we ask people to follow Jesus, it is also the same by means of Submitting ourselves to his yoke and authority. So let me ask you, what keeps you from truly following Jesus? What hinders you to truly submit to the king? What stops you from surrendering to the authority of King Jesus? Is it a fear of man? The danger about fearing man is that God becomes small. If you fear man, that's actually a form of pride where you desire to exalt yourself and not really the God who has called you to submit. Is it the pleasures of this world? That the reason why you don't want to submit to the king is because this world offers you other things. There are other little kings that would try to give you would try to give you temporary satisfaction, but in the end, it's going to fail you. Friends, are you taking seriously your walk with God today? Is He your King? And let me just remind you, and even as David is reminding us in Psalm 2, our rebellion and disobedience towards God has an end. It has an end. It's either God is going to provide wrath on you, or it is God rescuing you today and you seeing yourself as an enemy of God. Which one will you choose? Because in verses 10... To 12, it tells us we need the king. We need the king. David says, now therefore, he's proclaiming this, O kings and rulers, be wise. He's giving a sober warning 
to the Gentile kings and rulers. Be wise, David says, know who you are against with. Be warned, you still have time to back out. You still have time to raise a white flag and say, I am an enemy of God and I want to be part of God's kingdom. I want to be part of the king's kingdom. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise and be warned, O rulers of the earth. He's persuading. He's calling them out. Put down your armors. Surrender now. There's no one other like him. And in C, in verses 11 to 12, God's imperatives. So, if David is calling the Gentile kings, this is also God's summons to us today. He's calling us, if we hate the king today, he's calling us to submit our lives to the king. Why? Because we need him. That's what Psalm 2 says. These embedded memory of a king in our lives to rule, it's not you. It's not you and me. It's Christ. You cannot figure out how to rule your life. So quit. You can. That's what Psalm 2 says to us. Says to us. Now therefore, O kings, be wise and be warned, O rulers of the earth. So what should we do? Verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear. Now you might think in the first glance that means like doing things for the Lord. Keeping yourselves busy, being part of a ministry in the church. But that's not what it says. Serve the Lord with fear means that you are ready to place your complete allegiance and loyalty to the true king. This is what we called worship. Where we can say to our King Jesus, Lord, do anything in me that you need to do in order to do everything through me that you want to do. That's what, serve, that, that's what serving the Lord with fear means. It's not like you giving him the terms. Lord, I'm, just, I'm going to follow you if you're going to bless my business. I'm going to follow you if you're going to bless me with a wife. I'm going to follow you if you're going to give me success. I'm going to follow you if you're going to make things right. That's not, that, is not, that is not the right posture of someone who's in front of a great king. We serve the king with fear. Without terms. And there are some people in this room, you come here every Sunday because you have a term with God. Friend, can I be honest with you? You are not serving the Lord. That's idolatry. You're serving a little king in your heart. What the king says here in the word is that without any terms, you follow him. Will you serve him with fear? Lord, do anything in me that you need to do in order to do everything through me that you want to do. Is this the cry of your heart today? And in verse 11 says, rejoice with trembling. Now, how can the word rejoicing be connected to the word trembling? Because when you behold the true king, when you worship the true king Jesus, your eyes are just fixed on him. And this is a, ki this is a kind of trembling that is not negative. This is a positive kind of trembling that allows your knees to kneel down and just look to him. And there's a word of amazement that increases the joy in your heart to be what? I'm all yours. I'm all yours. This world has nothing to do with my heart. I am yours. 
Is that your heart today? Friends, we need the king. We need the king. Then in verse 12, another summon from the king. Kiss the son. Kiss the son. What does it mean to kiss the son? The kiss in the ancient Near East means a sign of submission to an authority. But we are not simply submitting to a kind of authority that is similar to mankind today or the governments that we have today. This is a kind of authority that was never defeated even by the enemy. And this is the very authority that we have today if you're in Christ. Kiss the Son means you admit, I'm an enemy of God. This is similar to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, where Paul says, the saying is trustworthy. The tr saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost, of who I am the chief of all sinners. Kiss the Son. Are you ready to lay down your life to the sovereign king? Are you ready to take the yoke of the king? Matthew chapter 11 tells us that this is a kind of yoke that is easy to bear, different from the, what the Pharisees are talking about, different from religion. Because religion is just giving you things to do so that you can get to God. That's not the gospel. The gospel is simply God reaching down to us, giving to us the Lord Jesus Christ. So the things that we can't do, Christ did for us. Kiss the Son. And when we say we love you, Lord, it means we are willing to follow Him wherever He leads. And friends, this is the work of the Spirit in our hearts. And I pray that God will cause renewal in this room today. Kiss the Son. The remaining verses in verse 12. Lest they be angry, and you perish in the way for His wrath is quickly kindled. If you will not kiss the Son, if you will not submit your life to King Jesus, you cannot escape God's wrath. There's no middle ground. So if you're playing games with your Christianity today, look here. If you are playing games with your walk with God, are you ready to face judgment? It's either you face this or you kiss the sun. I pray that this morning that God will just wreck the ego and pride in your heart that don't want to be submitted to Christ. <laughs> and that's what God does in amazing ways. And the hope is this. When we kiss the sun, we experience life. When we kiss the sun, we are not any more enemies of the king, but we are called servants. But not only servants, but heirs, sons, and daughters of the king, Jesus. So church, we need the king. As we end, as we apply what we just learned in chapter 2, 
Behold our King Jesus. Stop looking in other offers of this world. Look to him. Behold him. Young people in this room, do not waste your adolescence. You might even say, well, a study, studies are my first priority. No, if you're a Christian student, God should be. If you're a business person in this room, who's your priority? Is it your business? If you're a Christian, then Christ should be the one ruling on how you do business. If you're a parent, you submit to the authority of Christ on how to lead your family, not the world says. If you're a single woman and man in this room, how you operate on your desires is not subjected to this world, but to the very authority that Christ has placed on you. And for all Christians in this room, we are under the loving lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ. So behold our King. Serve and delight in King Jesus. Submit and obey without the ifs. Lay down your terms. Follow the king. You cannot be the king. It will end badly for you. And the psalmist ends in chapter and verse 12. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Admit that you're an enemy of the king. Kiss the son. Serve him. Rejoice in him. Delight in him. At the end of the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the siblings were coronated together with Aslan. And that's a wonderful picture. Next slide. A wonderful picture that when we surrender and kiss the sun, we reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. Take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. Next slide, brother. And the saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. Yes, we hate the king, but we have the true king. And we need the king. And the way for us to experience what it means to reign with Jesus Christ is to submit to him. Will you today? Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word that calls us, that calls us to enter, enter the narrow gate that leads to life. Father, I pray that those who are here today, and even myself, will kiss the sun, will truly submit and worship you in reverence and fear, in rejoicing and trembling. Father, quicken our hearts to stop playing games with the king. Give us the gift of repentance. Give us the gift of faith to behold King Jesus. We need him. We need him. And Father, I know there are, there are people in this room who are already tired of being the king of their lives. Father, would you be gracious? Would you be gracious, Lord, to call them, to invite them, Lord, to come to you, that they may kiss the sun and that they may rejoice with you as well. Father, 
strengthen us. And we take the light. Because if we are in Christ, we reign with you. We will reign with you. And what a wonderful picture of the gospel that renews our hearts and makes that memory trace of a king a reality in him. Save us. We need the king desperately. In Christ we pray. Amen.